might be worried those dummies people are going to sue you or something. Your title, your cover looks just like one of those real dummies books. Well, it was, in fact, one of those real dummies books. Um, and I've, I've had occasion to give it to, to many people. Uh, um, and, and I've been working on climate change a very long time, which is the other thing that in the bio. Having worked as senior policy advisor to the Federal Minister of Environment from 1986 to 88, I was recruited by the Minister of Environment, which is an odd thing since I wasn't a conservative. But uh, they wanted someone in the, office, in the minister's office who was actually an environmental activist. Um, the number of people in this room uh, know me as an anti-nuclear, anti-pesticide activist like Dorothy Gold Rosenberg and Lynn McDonald, the people who knew me way before even Sierra Club. I'd been working on environmental issues since I was a teenager. And I came into the Minister of Environment's office, and that's where I started to learn about uh, the climate issue because I was, at that point, as I said, an activist on a number of other issues. But I sat with the Minister of Environment, and Environment Canada scientists, we had Environment Canada scientists in those days, and Environment Canada scientists would brief the Minister on the science of what they were seeing coming if we continued to increase our dependency on fossil fuels, if we didn't get off fossil fuels, if we didn't reduce greenhouse gases, we would be looking at a future impact called climate change. I can remember the briefings really well because I both found them terrifying and convincing. And the nightmare of the whole thing for me is that I've been working on the climate issue for 29 years. And in that period of time, the things that were once just predictions are now headlines. And as Matthew said, we had a lot of procrastination, a lot of denial, and a lot of lost time. We did, in fact, have a reasonably decent climate plan in 2005 of course, as soon as and it was Paul Martin's government that brought it out, but it was immediately canceled, not by a vote in Parliament, mind you, but by the Prime Minister acting alone when Stephen Harper canceled the only climate plan we had and proceeded to ramp up greenhouse gases. There are a lot of milestones on the way to where we are now, but where we are now is desperate last measures to avoid runaway global warming. We no longer have the capacity technologically or in terms of atmospheric chemistry to avoid climate change. We have loaded the atmosphere with greenhouse gases to such an extent that we now have more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere than any time in the last at least 800,000 years by direct measurement of air bubbles and Antarctic ice cores. We know that we are 30% more CO2 in the atmosphere than at any time in roughly a million years as compared to the levels, and we have greenhouse gas levels uh, never above 280 parts per million. And we're now hovering very near the 400 parts per million mark. Scientists had anticipated this. Some published papers in the late 1800s. It's not uh, a controversial concept that loading the atmosphere with gases that cause warming without the natural greenhouse effect this planet would be far too cold to sustain any kind of life at all. So we know the greenhouse effect. We understand it. It's been all of, through all of humanity's history, it's been entirely beneficial. If we hadn't had it, we wouldn't be here at all. Okay, so fast forward where we are now, we are in a situation of a danger zone where some people will argue the thresholds have already been crossed. We can't know that. I have been involved in this issue for so long and keep uh, firmly believing and looking at the science and crunching the numbers all the time to know that we still have the possibility globally to avoid two degrees global average temperature increase above the levels of temperature below before the Industrial Revolution. I've been participating in all the UN climate negotiations, and the next one coming up is the deadline for a replacement treaty. We should have had one in Copenhagen. That was a complete train wreck. I'm happy to talk about what happened there if anyone wants to know. It was a disaster. We can't afford a disaster in Paris. This is not a debate between liberals, greens, and NDPers. So I want to make that really clear. This is about saving Canada from Stephen Harper and getting the climate plan in time for Paris. We have to figure out how to work it out. And we can work it out because I think the next parliament will be a minority parliament. And with enough Green MPs, we'll work with anybody. We're, we're absolutely shameless in our willingness to work with anyone, <laughs> anyone who's willing to step up. Because when I sat in those negotiations in Lima, December of 2014, I saw what was really missing in the room. I mean, there's no contest that there's now fierce competition for worst country in the room. 
We used to own it, you know? That podium, we owned that podium. Worst country in the room, Canada under Stephen Harper. Now we've got a competition with Australia under Tony Abbott. We've got mushy middle countries. We used to have strong leadership from the European Union. They're quite compromised by a number of domestic issues within the EU. What's missing in the room isn't the worst country in the room. What's missing in the room is leadership. So when I look forward to Paris, I'm looking forward to a new parliament. I think in terms of what parliament looks like, not like race through what government looks like. What does parliament look like? And well, can we get it together from the opposition benches where we will have more MPs than anything else through cooperation to actually go to Paris, not just with a better Canadian plan, but with a plan for Canada to bring forward tough negotiators, the best diplomats we ever had, and a team that goes to Paris and negotiates the treaty the world needs, because we're not going to get another chance. Now, in terms of our domestic policies as Greens, because that's part of the question I was asked to answer, we've always favored carbon pricing and removing subsidies. That's so basic. The World Bank, the IMF, absolutely everyone around the world now calls for that, except for some Canadian parties. We would bring in carbon pricing through fee and dividend. So the fee would probably be around $200, $225 a ton, which would deliver about $5,000 to every Canadian. That's back of the envelope stuff, but roughly right. We have to maximize energy efficiency. This, in this country, we still waste more than half the energy we use. That's still our low-hanging fruit. The low-hanging fruit for so long, we're stopping all over it. We are the squashed fruit on the ground on that one. We can, we can do that. And we've seen leadership from the provincial and government of Ontario shutting down coal-fired power plants. That's the number one thing we need to do. Alberta's coal-fired power plants still, at this point, produce roughly the same amount of greenhouse gases as the oil sites. So the thing we need to do is go after coal-fired power and shut it down everywhere. We are encouraged by China's commitment to have 20% of its electricity grid renewables, but China's coal-fired power still represents a real threat. But every country has to move as fast and aggressively as it can to decarbonize its economy. And that's something we need to talk about more. We need fuel switching. Our vehicle fleet should be switching very rapidly to either new fuels, hybrids, or electric vehicles as much as possible. And then we're not producing our electricity from coal anymore, which means we need a, a, uh, a better Canadian grid that, share, that we can sell and buy and share in, uh, the electricity from the renewable provinces and the ones that are making the transition off coal. It's a lot of detail here I can't get into. But I just want to, with the last, I think I have a minute left, say that this is not an issue that stands as one of many priorities. This is the priority. Naomi Klein had it right. This changes everything. This is not about tweaking at the edges or the margins of our society. This is a transformational change of our economy. This will require rapid, aggressive, action to avoid two degrees, and not just from Canada. From every country around the world, we are going to need significant commitment to put fossil fuels on the shelves of history altogether. Coal, natural gas, oil, all of it. We have to rapidly move off fossil fuels so that we're using roughly 90% less than today by mid-century 2050. Yes, that's ambitious, but we did it faster than that when we moved from horse and buggies into cars. We have had technological innovations. We've had transformational change. This time, we do it because we're planning it, because our life depends on it. Thank you. a lot of committed activists in this room who are going to keep working with climate action. So I thought I'd mention a few things because it's always hard to give complete answers with as much detail as I'd like to share. But if you wanted to see where the Green Party is on all these issues, plus more on our website, it's a document called Vision Green, which covers that. We focus a lot on carbon pricing in the public debate. And from my point of view, carbon pricing is a sine qua non. It's the start. It's not the whole program. It's not the whole plan. You need carbon pricing, and then you need all the other aggressive steps that help make the shift to renewables, to make the shift to retrofitting <coughs> buildings, that shift our transportation infrastructure. 
So for very good information that I've relied on, I thought I'd mention a couple of websites because it's really hard to get good information these days. How do we actually see ourselves getting from here to where we need to be? One of the best projects, it's global, but it has a chapter on Canada, is called Deep Decarbonization. So if you haven't looked up the Deep Decarbonization, all one word with decarbonization spelled with a Z, deepdecarbonization.org, it's very good, it's quite, it's quite detailed, it gives you stuff to really dig in, and it's got a specific country chapter on, well, obviously China, US, but also there's a country chapter on Canada, which is very instructive for how we actually get off fossil fuels. And similarly, for good news information, you can go to cleanenergycanada.org. They put together very good examples of where we're seeing programs that, that, that show us the light of day, and that's worth looking at. So because you're all activists, I thought I'd also leave you with a to-do list. Everyone always wonders what I can do between now and then. Right now, Canada should be preparing for the UN system. In order to get a treaty by Paris in December, the process has determined that we want to see, not wait till in the horrible experience of Copenhagen, but where after everybody left, the IPCC got a chance to crunch the numbers and see if the collectivity of promises made by all the countries that were there in the back room with Barack Obama, if they all keep their promises, does it avoid two degrees? No, it didn't. And of course, Canada didn't keep its promises. So the system within the UN negotiation, which is all countries, which is Canada's agreed to this, are supposed to table their pledges for Paris in the first quarter of this year, so by the end of this month. Unfortunately, the language got quite watered down, so it said by the end of the, of the first quarter, for those countries prepared to do so. But this needs to be better known among climate activists. We need to be, I've, I've asked in Parliament, and of course gotten up with a typical non-answer from Leona Gluka, because she reads from card that had nothing to do with my question. Similarly, <laughs> last Friday, last time I asked her a question, question here, I didn't ask her, I asked Stephen Blaney, Minister of Public Security, if we could organize a scientific briefings for the RCMP so they'd understand climate change and not write uh, appalling reports on anti-petroleum activists who somehow claim to believe greenhouse gases are causing climate change. Uh, last point, quickly, we need to ensure that, that climate becomes an election issue. In, to this, I am totally committed, and I would appreciate your support when the time comes to ensure I get in the leaders' debate. I think I'm in, by all the people that are heard of it. So I would appreciate your support to make sure that I can raise climate throughout the leaders' debate. And again, the pledges are due the first quarter of March, the end of this month, first quarter of 2015, so that they can be assessed before Paris. I think it's really important to put a priority on getting the proper, full, comprehensive, global deal that we need to go off carbon. We need to achieve it in December 2015 at COP21. Thank you.